I'm Dr. Rick Green from the Medical School Class of 1970, and it's my great pleasure to host this series that's dedicated to talking to our uh, wonderful emeritus faculty uh, at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And today I have the great privilege of talking to Dr. John Dent, Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine. And uh, John, thank you very much for being with us. I'm honored, Dr. Green. So, uh, obviously, uh, you've seen many things go on in, in, in the realm of cardiovascular medicine. Uh, you didn't go to medical school here, but you came here for your training. Tell me a little about what made you stay. Well, I, I came in a tremendously exciting period, which was the mid-1980s. Exciting both for UVA and then also for cardiovascular care, because the 80s and then the early 90s were when all the major drugs for cardiovascular disease improved. And also we began offering angioplasty as a um, treat, non-medical treatment for, for uh, coronary disease. And also my division took off under the leadership of Dr. George Beller, who I know has spoken with you previously. Dr. Beller was a tremendous recruiter and uh, uh, trained in, uh, for, was a medical student here and then went to Boston for training and then brought in a number of dynamic leaders. And so he, I think, tripled the division, which was tremendous. Our, our volume went up. And the most important thing he did was he brought a lot of research in. And for a young trainee like me, uh, participating in research is a great way to dive into the field. And so that's, that's really why I stayed um, after residency was because I wanted to work with these people, Dr. Beller and all these people he brought in who were absolutely fantastic teachers. Now you've had an interest in valvular disease, I think, and some other areas. Tell me a little about your research you've been doing. Yes, um, so I, um, I became very interested in uh, echocardiography as a resident and then mm -hmm. a fellow because the field was taking off at that time too. And uh, one of the things you can do with echo is look at valves. And, and you can learn so much from echocardiography about valves. And so the two went together in my career. Earlier in my career, we did some really interesting research looking at uh, the mechanisms of how the valves opened and closed, which you would think would be a really simple thing because it's just a valve. But it turns out it involves all the function of the heart itself. And one of the highlights of that actually was that I um, was able to do open heart surgery in an animal model with two of our senior surgeons, Dr. Nolan and Dr. Spotnitz. And so I was scrubbed in with them like I was a high-level surgical fellow, and they're meticulous surgeons. And we were also had a number of other people helping us, including an anesthesiologist, and so it was absolutely tremendous. And we learned a lot about in the 90s about how the valves would work, which recently has been really important because of the percutaneous valve program that I'm sure you're familiar with, where we've been switching over from open-heart surgery in many patients to catheter-based therapy. And so that uh, rise paralleled my career at UVA and was tremendously exciting. And great for patients. Well, it's 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 actually amazing to me. It was I was going into cardiac surgery when I first started my residency in surgery, and it's amazing to see what has now evolved by our cardiology colleagues in yes. doing some of the things that surgeons were doing years ago. And I'm sure you've you've been involved in this. The the, the best thing about it is the partnerships that we create when we did that uh, were entirely inclusive. And so in order to get a percutaneous valve into a patient safely, it takes a number of cardiologists to decide, you know, what's the right thing for the patient. It takes an interventionalist, it takes a surgeon, a cardiovascular anesthesiologist, and then a whole other team in the room of support people who have to work very closely together. I'm sure you're familiar with this. And that's one of the things that changed in my career was how important it came for us to work in teams. At the beginning of my career, we, were, we thought we were working in teams. You know, nobody was working against each other. But as, as my career evolved, I saw more and more that the job of the cardiologist was to be a good team member. And I really like the fact that we work so closely with our surgeons and cardiovascular anesthesiologists because we learn so much from each other. And of course it was best for patients. Right. I'm, I'm really intrigued with your work with the medical students, especially with the curriculum, the next generation curriculum. Tell me a little something how you got involved in that early on and, and, and how cardiovascular medicine fits into the curriculum. Yes, yeah, so, um, a number of uh, bright people in our medical school realized that the, um, that the um, older method of training medical students or educating medical students the way um, you and I probably learned where all the subjects were sort of dealt with separately and then they hoped would magically come together was not the best way. And so they created this next-gen curriculum where we blended all the sciences with the clinical instruction and taught at the same time. That was a tremendous challenge to achieve that. Uh, it was a bold dream. And uh, what I liked the best about it was um, I got involved very early in the first year or two and it really wasn't succeeding at first because we all had a hard time working together. 
this, everybody wanted more time for their subject. You know, it's natural. The, the physiologists wanted more time for physiology. We wanted more time for maybe the medicine aspects. And we all had to get together and work together. And I was, one of the, I was the original system leader at that point. And I basically had to work and negotiate with all these really brilliant teachers to make sure we had a curriculum that was what the students needed and that it was appropriate and balanced. And then we, the best thing about it was that we showed the students that we could work together. And so I think at times medical students may wonder, well, you know, how helpful is a basic scientist in pharmacology when you're practicing? Well, the answer is very, very helpful. You need to know these principles and you'll be using them your whole career. And the next time curriculum has been tremendously successful. Uh, we still need to keep in, improving it, but that was one of the, I think, my favorite activities I did in my career. And probably the best part, besides working with these talented professors, is working with really bright UVA students. Absolutely. I'm sure it's a thrill. You've been uh, awarded many teaching uh, awards uh, through the Mulholland Society and some other areas. Tell me, what makes a good teacher? What, what, what are your thoughts on being a good teacher? The, um, I think that so the, the, the first thing when I walk in the room is I have to have uh, an empathy for the student experience, which becomes tougher the further you get away from being a medical student. And uh, you, you basically have to be on their side and be able to look at the material through their eyes. And it's a tremendous amount to learn. It's a very stressful period. If you show the students that you're on their side and you're going to be an advocate for them and you listen to them and make changes, that's step one. And then step two is making sure that what you teach them is really going to be useful to them in their career and important and not just something you're interested in yourself. And so that's what I tried to do with our faculty as a faculty leader was convey that enthusiasm and then keep a focus on things that will be useful for the students. And I think if you do that, you're very, very successful. So as you've thought about transitioning from being a very active clinician, which you, you don't want to get away from medicine, obviously, you're researching, but what do you want to do now? What's, what's, what's the next thing for you? I hope to have a um, kind of a blended portfolio of mostly volunteer activities. Um, I helped to co-found our Institute for Healthcare Improvement chapter at UVA with students. And in fact, the students actually run it. I'm just a mentor. I kind of like get them the experiences they need and hook them up to people they need. And I'm continuing to do that. I'm going to be going down to Southwest Virginia in a couple of weeks for the health wagon to help out with underserved mm. patients um, so I can keep using my cardiovascular skills where, the, where it's needed. And then at some point I plan to do some administrative work, probably um, what I really enjoyed in the last 15 years of my career is um, trying to standardize those parts of care that should be standardized. And accreditation is a part of that. So I've been working with a, a accrediting agency that accredits, um, among other things, echocardiography laboratories. And I served on their board for 10 years and was president for several years. And I really enjoy setting standards and then um, helping people to improve by those standards. And so I think I might get involved. The area I'm probably going to focus on is the ACGME, which is, you know, overseas uh, resident training, has a new program called the Clinical Learning Environment Review Program where they came up with a great idea saying it's not enough to just, you know, give your residents a you know, good experience in lectures, etc. You want to look at where they're actually learning and make sure that it's the type of setting that they will be practicing in when they leave here and they'll be able to continue to improve. And earlier in my career, I don't feel like that was always the case. Um, a lot of times, um, we didn't have enough uh, focus on quality improvement and patient safety. And so I'm thinking about getting involved with the ACGME, actually. And what they do is they go around and actually audit and then seek to improve programs, which you're probably familiar with. It can be a little scary for programs when, you, when the accrediting agencies come in. I was a program director you know, for cardiology for over a decade, and you're always a little nervous. The nice thing about this program is it's very, very supportive, and it's a little less viewed, not as punitively, more like going in and helping them out, actually. That's your typical RRC. No, no, and I can tell you some stories about that too. Oh, sure you can. <laughs> so I want to ask you because you you've seen it, um, the introduction of the eighty-hour work week, and I'd like to get your thoughts, uh, especially from somebody who's been working with residents in cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I, um, well, I think that um, we switched from the model that you and I learned under, which is sort of the apprentice model, and we're gradually moving towards more of a competency-based model. We're still not there yet. I, I know we will be one day. Um, the 80-hour work week, um, I think, was probably a good idea. I, I don't think overworking residents, for the most part, is very, very helpful. I think you need to enrich the time that they spend there. That's why this clinical learning environment is so important. Now, it is true that you need enough hours in the, in the hospital, and you know this as a surgeon, to see a lot of things. And so you, and being there, there's no substitute for really being there. I think at times, though, we were really overusing our residents for labor. And the one thing that really happened uh, great in the last part of my career um, I was assigned um, as the medical director of our inpatient nurse practitioner service. 
And so with a lot of funding from the hospital, we built it to over 20 practitioners. So my solution to the cutting back the hours is to enrich their experience so they're still learning as much as they would have, and then to have other providers to help out with the care so that they're not running around putting fires out. They have a, a nice balance, actually. And so I think the whole thing is pretty successful. Well, it's wonderful to see somebody like you not getting far away from your medical roots. That's nice, nice to see. We've been talking with Dr. John Dent, professor of cardiovascular medicine, wonderful professor here at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. John, thank you so much for Thank you, Dr. Us. Green. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.